The interiors of Art Nouveau can be seen as part of a long history of theatrical and innovative high-status interiors intended to impress visitors and represent their owners' taste, wealth, and cultural capital. Art Nouveau interiors have also been approached as part of histories of modern design, where the emphasis has been on the use of new materials and technologies and new principles, such as revealed construction, conspicuous craftsmanship, and the total work of art. Without meaning to dismiss any of these points of interpretation, my focus today is on an attribute of Art Nouveau interiors that is particular though not entirely unique to them, and to the cultural context of their conceptualization. Many Art Nouveau interiors were conceived by designers and patrons as manifestations of a new, modern form of consciousness, and even as tools for the realization or furthering of this modern consciousness. They were spaces designed to address modern individuals, newly aware of the functioning of their minds and bodies. They were designed to restore and protect psyches that were perceived as jarred and shattered by the pres pressures of modern life. And they were designed to facilitate pursuit of a new unity between body, mind, and spirit, even in a transcendence to a higher level of being. This paper will briefly present a series of case studies from across European Art Nouveau. And I shall argue that a full understanding of the often astonishing interiors created during this period depends on recognizing them not simply as artworks, but also as instruments of stimulation. The user was addressed not just on a visual level, but across the spectrum of the senses, as designers sought to affect the whole body. The impact of light and dark, enclosed and open space, profusion and absence of ornament, intriguing variations in surfaces and color modulations, unexpected sight lines and the disruption of expected relationships were more than mere dramatic artifice. The user was transported in their exploration of these new interiors and their connections to the mundane world severed. This project of transportation was not sought simply for the sake of novelty, but as part of a wider project in pursuit of the new man and woman. The cultural aftershocks of Darwin's theory of natural selection continued to reverberate. The awful simplicity and amorality of the pursuit of new and better forms in nature multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die held out the tantalizing possibility of the continued transformation and betterment of the human race, as well as the spectre of its alternative, degeneration through the multiplication of the unfit. The development of the new medical discipline of psychology offered new modes of understanding the human psyche. That this new science was so quick to penetrate contemporary culture was due to its resonances with wider concerns regarding the modern self. Across the fields of the arts, writers and artists sought to dig beneath the surface. Symbolist authors like Huisman and Metalink played with rich imagery, sensory depth, and stylistic abstraction to conjure feeling and sensation, to horrify and enchant. Others, such as Ibsen and James, produced works of challenging psychological depth exposing the fault lines between human needs and the unforgiving apparatus of modern manners and morals. The philosophies of Henri Bergson, Theodore Lips, and above all, Friedrich Nietzsche, sought to acknowledge the power of forces which could not be seen, the intuitive power of the human psyche, and relational forces acting on that psyche, both between individuals and between individuals and their environment. In the work of these writers, and the many writers inspired by their ideas, the modern world was represented as having ensnared and enfeebled mankind, cutting it off from the creative forces of the spirit. To break these toils was the challenge to which humanity must rise. Success in this venture required the breaking of unnecessary fetters of the convention in order to free the human spirit and to ascend to a higher state of being. These visions could be either resplendent or terrifying, 
as the costs were high in terms of traditional faith, morality, and human connections, while the cost of failure was bleakness of alienation, nihilism, and despair. In line with Darwin's theories and the empathy theory of Lips, environment had a vital role to play in this project. So I'll start with the Goel Palace, one of Gaudi's key early commissions. From the rigorous ornament to the emphasis on dramatic processional transitions through space, the design uses the Gothic idiom to create a dynamic sensory environment which departed from the familiar to a potentially disorientating extent. This is the entrance hall. Visitors would arrive by carriage, carried off the narrow and somewhat disreputable street where the palace stood, conveyed under dramatic iron portals into this austere, cool stone hall, a street within the house. Gaudi planned a route for the visitor that took them up through the house, turns and returns in the route, as well as openings between rooms, prevented clear apprehension of the scale or layout of the palace. The result was one of imaginative disorientations and the illusion of potentially infinite space, the need to control temperature by restricting direct sunlight into the building had the further effect of disrupting potential reorientation in reference to the outside world. The experience of the environment was carefully orchestrated. So from, from the grey stone of the entrance, through a progressive enrichment of the palette of materials to include new varieties of stone, wood, metalwork, the spaces became progressively more subtle. The incremental deprivation of orientation in space in favor of the steady enrichment of sensory detail culminated in the main hall that was the spiritual and aesthetic apotheosis of the palace. And this is the ceiling view. Um, here diffused light and sound from the hidden organ and the musician's gallery completed the transformative journey. Understanding the effect of environment upon the psyche developed hand in hand with apprehension of the damage, <coughs> damaging character of modern environments, both the city and the strictures of polite society. This commission for a treehouse is an example of an attempt to escape through architecture. A treehouse dreamed up by the Princess Marie at Sinai Palace, Romania, um, called The Nest and by Bailey Scott. British-born Marie um, was oppressed by her role as princess consort under the watchful eye of a conservative court. The treehouse reflects her interest in fairy tale and childhood as a period of freedom. The route to the house through the woods, up a wooden staircase tower, across a high-rise walkway, marks a retreat into a space of play. Again, what is found within is simultaneously a, an aesthetic and a spiritual experience and a union of multiple art forms. The decorative scheme was based on floral symbolism inspired by verses by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The main room was dedicated to the sun and the sunflower, motifs of love and fertility repeated on many surfaces. An oratory alcove was lily-themed, and through this can be seen, um, it can also be seen to suit its forest location embedded in nature though the interior makes little reference to the forest outside. The fantastic route taken by visitors up into the treetops is part of the journey, but the interior is another realm again, one that addressed the inner life through embodied experience. And you've already seen this today. Um, the centerpiece of the Ryabashinsky House in Moscow, this sculptural staircase, um, a dram dramatic space at the core of the house, the stairway um, of this hall is otherworldly and unstable, with diffused light from a stained glass window and skylight, and electric light softly illuminating the wavering form of the marble aggregate staircase. It lies at the heart of the house and makes no reference to the external world of the Moscow street outside. Uh, rather, it evokes a dynamic organicism of a rippling underwater world, which we've also heard about today. Um, it is the manipulated light that unifies the interior, as well as that color palette of green, and transforms it from an aesthetic curiosity into a journey into another world. 
Ryabashinsky House was owned by a young industrialist who was a member of the network of old believer merchant families in Moscow and a collector of Russian icons. The innovative idiom and underwater fairy tale theme of his home allowed him to embody his aspirations for a Russian cultural revival, but was also one of personal transformation made possible through a departure from the realm of the mum uh, departure from the realms of the mundane. The thematic inspiration um, is the Russian fairy tale of Sadko, a musician adventurer who woos the daughter of the king of the sea. This tale inspired, among others, Rimsky-Korsakov's opera, Sadko, premiered in 1898, um, this painting by Ilya Repin. Um, and it was also the theme taken by the artist Elena Luchmakowski for one of her panels for the famous Beethoven exhibition at the Vienna Secession in 1902, where this theme of otherworldly travels and transformation were united. The interior used innovative materials and technologies, um, as well as the integrated electrical light, alongside more traditional crafts used in innovative ways. You can see how the parquet floor what breaks into wave patterns that echo the themes of the staircase and other details. The stained glass at the head of the stairs ensures that the light filtering down is appropriately bluish and watery. Schechtel's background was in theatre design before he was able to break into architectural practice making the theatricality of his interiors particularly accomplished. The manipulation of light was a central part of this, and this can be seen in a host of Art Nouveau uh, examples. Eliel Saarinen, Finnish architect's Villa Girardet, was designed for a competition for a villa for the German publisher and printer Wilhelm Girardet. It got second place out of 186 entries in the competition in 1904. The illustrations published in Modern Balformen reveal a series of richly ornamented interiors suffused with glowing light. Nearly every window in the villa is treated with stained glass, so that though the overall dark design of the building was closely integrated with a formal garden layout, once inside there is no contact with the outside world. We can see something similar here in Horta's Hotel van Eetveld, um, where the interior reception rooms dramatized an, evo an evocation of the exotic colonized space of the Belgian Congo. Another example, um, Louis Domeneschi Montana's uh, Casa Leo Morera in Barcelona, which transformed an existing townhouse into a modern Catalan Gothic Moorish palace. The richly ornamented interiors are illuminated by extensive stained glass windows. Um, and in the scheme for this glazed gallery, which faced the inner courtyard and the yards of the other houses on the street, we see instead the mountains of the Catalan landscape, including the mulberry bush associated with the name Morera, an alternative vista to the dense urban view that actually lay outside. The space within is bathed in natural light, but it's not the light of the modern city. Instead, it offers a vision of rural Catalonia that spoke both of nationalist nostalgia and a shared dream for future independence. And this second photograph of the same interior um, presents the Art Nouveau interior not simply as a site for escapism and private dreaming. The men are in contemporary dress, engaged in the perusal of the latest newspapers. They are figures of the Barcelona out art world, including the photographer, the, um, artists, and so on, their activity within the Catalan National Revival is perfectly framed by the space, not a retreat from the world, but a transcending of the limits of present realities. <coughs> Otto Wagner's design for the Steinhoff Mental Asylum outside Vienna represents the coming together of new thinking on architecture for mental well-being across both the psychiatric and design professions. The church, which sits at the geographic and conceptual apex of the complex, encapsulates Wagner's efforts to contribute to the therapeutic treatment of the patients. The regular Greek cross plan of the building, with its central dome and the dominant palette of white marble and gold details, embodies the principle of balance and calm joy. 
The bodily needs of patients were addressed through design details like the absence of steps to trip over and the substitution of a holy water faucet for the traditional stoop to prevent the passing on of infection. Subtle control over the patients was facilitated through varying the length of the benches so that calm patients could sit in larger groups than potentially unquiet ones. <clears throat> Access to the pulpit and the organ loft was also carefully restricted as Wagner looked into all the details for the design in, in, in discussion with the medical professionals. The mental and spiritual needs of the patients were addressed through the use of light and color to uplift and calm, and also through the iconography, which replaced potentially disquieting images of Christian suffering with a benign paternal deity and a pantheon of calm, caring saints and angels, all modeling a rapt devotional attentiveness to the pulpit. Um, there are parallels with Mary Seton Watts's chapel at Compton, the Greek cross plan and central domed space within represents a phenomenology of balance and a symbology of the cardinal points and the four elements. The building was simultaneously a gesture of love between husband and wife and a realization of Seton Watts's spiritual and ethical beliefs and a release of her creative energies after her career as an artist was set aside for her role as a wife and helpmate. The interior was marked by a complex symbology that ranged across times and geographies in pursuit of spiritual resonances that, if not universal, were at least ones that would transcend the limitations of the contemporary world. <coughs> the making of the work, which involved the hand modeling of ornament in terracotta for the exterior and in gesso for the interior, meant that every inch of the building bore the mark of human creative endeavor. The vision, was uh, the vision realized was Seton Watts's, but also that of over 70 local people who participated in the project, presumably motivated by their own spiritual and creative needs. Though the iconography of the chapel required a special guidebook to make sense of it, the colors and rhythms, I'll just go back, the colors and rhythms of the ornamental scheme achieved a more immediate impact, building, linking, and repeating as it rises up the walls. Seton Watts's mystical approach can be captured in the following quote from the end of her guidebook, The Word in the Pattern, describing the main door. The rhythmic run-on sentences echo the visual forms of the interlocking ornament, illuminating its transportative spiritual purpose. And I quote, Behind the cross on the door, there is a glimpse through a circle into light, circle within circle, with flames and wings, Eternity, mystery, light, motion, spirituality, protection. Ruling above the mystery of darkness, the dragon below, smitten through by the cross. End quote. I finish with an image of Freud's study from Bergasse 19, including the famous assemblage of archaeological fragments sur and surmounted by the image of the Abu Simbel temples, which had been lost and were rediscovered by archaeologists in the early 19th century. Freud often favored the analogy of the archaeological when discussing the function of psychoanalysis in bringing to light that which was buried beneath the surface. In addition to this, we see the couch, covered in the warm, rich pile of turkey carpet and multiple cushions, so that the body of the ana analysand is both cocooned and gently stimulated by patterns and colors. These varied examples from across European Art Nouveau all evince the widespread awareness that the mind of the subject could be touched and affected by their environment. Going beyond concern for the healthy body, which was another strand of modernism, these designs and many others addressed the mind, not simply in pursuit of health, but in pursuit of a more complex and nuanced set of ideas based around the assumption of depths not yet fully plumbed and vistas not yet fully realized. Through the orchestration of light, materials, acoustics, colors and patterns, different associations, perceptions and experiences could be set in motion. 
the conceptual tools of fairy tale, myth, and the distant past, which were commonly employed, were also shared by the emerging discipline of psychoanalysis. The inward turn represented by these interiors was not solely a retreat from the harshness of the modern world. It can also be understood as a striving towards the greater depths of perception, consciousness, sensibility, and wisdom that would mark humanity's next stage of evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you.